Thank you for joining today's webinar, Campylobacter, the what, when, where and why. My name is Jodie Rizzo O'Brien and I'm one of the Sheep Connect SA team. Tonight's webinar and the activities of Sheep Connect South Australia is supported by Australian Wool Innovation, the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund, the Department of Primary Industries and Regions. If you'd like to know more about Sheep Connect, you can visit our website or follow us on Twitter. Today's presenter is Michelle. Michelle is a technical advisor for Cooper's Animal Health, where she's been working for the past six years, and she's based in Armidale in New South Wales. Before she commenced at Cooper's, Michelle completed a PhD in parasitology, determining the cost of worms in prime land production in the Northern Tablelands region of New South Wales. Outside of work, Michelle takes the dogs for a run, she horse rides, and she spends time with families. At this time, I'll hand over to Michelle, who will talk to us about Campy. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Jody. Um, and welcome everybody. And again, thank you, Jody, for taking the, um, the time to organize this webinar tonight. Um, she spoke to me um, late last week and mentioned that um, she had had some recent inquiries about Campylobacter um, with many farmers wanting to know a little bit more about it. So it's a great opportunity to speak to you tonight um, about Campylobacter and getting a little bit more familiar with it and the impact it may have on your farm. So these are the few um, topics I'd like to cover tonight. So firstly, I'll just discuss what Campylobacter is. And from now on, I'll probably call it Campy. It's obviously a little bit easier to say. Um, we'll look at the impact and the effect it may have on your farm and on landmarking um, percentages and results. And how is Campy actually transmitted within your flock? Uh, we have done um, ourselves, Cooper's Animal Health, a prevalence survey um, over a number of years. So I've got a map here that can show you, um, you know, where we have found Campylobacter and um, the prevalence it may be in your region as well. We'll also look at some control strategies. I have also included, um, so we can take some blood samples um, to determine um, if there may have been some recent exposure to one or two or both of the strains of Campylobacter. So I have included a couple of examples here and I'll just let you know how I have interpreted the results. And there's also um, a vaccine available um, to protect animals against Campylobacter infection. So I'll just take you through that as well. So firstly, no doubt um, the objective on all your farms would be to primarily get more lambs on the ground. Um, Obviously, this, um, there are many factors that can contribute to this and many factors that can contribute potentially to a poor landmarking. So obviously, we, we always consider you know, the pre-joining. We want to make sure the rams are in ideal health and also your nutrition is on a well, raise it rising plane of nutrition and their body condition score is optimal at joining time. So these are certainly big factors that contribute to, um, I guess, conception rates at, um, as well. The next important tool I really encourage farmers to um, include in their management strategies is to scan use. Um, not only is this important to A, to identify dry use, but also have the ability then to um, place use that have multiple fetuses um, into paddocks that may have better nutrition compared to um, that what might be required for a single bearing ewe. Not only that, um, it's good for that reason, but it also may identify if you've got a poor scanning rate or poor pregnancy rate, it just might highlight that something may have gone wrong earlier, um, you know, at the time that rams may have been joined, uh, the ewes may have been joined or the rams came in. So it just gives you an opportunity to break down if you are getting some poor landmarking results, could it be, um, um, I guess if you have scanned then you're pulling out the um, the dries, but it just gives you a lot more information. From scanning to uh, lambing, um, and then lam um, when you do assess how well your lambing went at lamb marking time, there's obviously um, a lot of things that may also contribute to good lamb marking results or poor. So we do know there could be difficult um, births. Um, obviously the predation, which is a difficult one with foxes and dogs in certain areas. And then when you sometimes um, you might get some really poor weather, some cold, wet, windy days. So these all, all contribute to some mortalities during this time, along with mismothering. But the one we'll focus on today is disease. And um, we'll be talking about um, primary Campylobacter, but I'll just touch on a couple of different organisms as well. 
So I am going to be talking about um, late term abortion. So we are going to be focused on the last trimester of pregnancy. That's why I'd really do like including scanning for a lot of reasons in a program. So we do know that um, Campylobacter is the main um, organism that will cause abortions in Australian ewes, but there's also others. There's Toxo, you're probably very familiar with, Listeria, Salmonella and Brusso. So Campylobacter may be the main one, but there's certainly other organisms that may cause abortions in ewes. So Campylobacter is a bacterial infection and the, the, um, the Campylobacter strains affecting sheep are Campylobacter fetus fetus and jejuni. Now, I very often get asked the question, um, is this the same strains that affect cattle? But no, they are different. Um, and the transmission of these bacteria to use differs from that with cattle as it is a venereal disease with cattle and oral transmission um, for sheep. So what losses do you see um, when campy may be affecting, having an effect on your farm? Obviously, I've spoken about late-term abortions and it start, they can occur in the last trimester. So often you might see one or two abortions that may start occurring six or seven weeks prior to lambing occurring. So we not only do you get abortions, depending on when a ewe may be infected, if she's infected closer to lambing, then you might get weak non-viable lambs or stillborn lambs. And also if a ewe is um, infected uh, quite close to lambing, she may um, lamb um, appropriately, but she might also um, have a poor milk um, supply just because of the infection she has. Off, you don't often see deaths from Campylobacter in use. However, um, it, it can certainly happen. It could be a secondary infection as well. Often the ewe may just abort and um, they are certainly healthy afterwards. Um, and that's what you often see at landmarking, high number of of ewes that um, have obviously aborted or lost their lamb and they're in a very, very good condition score. But as you can see, infections certainly aren't isolated to abortion events. And with um, abortions, you may sometimes see that if you're bringing use, a mob of ewes in for crutching prior to lambing or um, drenching prior to lambing, vaccinating prior to lambing, it might be four, four, five weeks prior to lambing, then you might see one or two abortions in the yard sometimes or blood uh, breached. Uh, blood stain breaches, which might um, I you know, suggest there may have been abortion. If there is an abortion and the other ewes have then um, been inquisitive and um, orally ingested some of the bacteria, it can take about a week to two or well, a week to three weeks after that event for other ewes to start um, aborting as well. So you might have one or two ewes start aborting, but it's usually a couple of weeks later when you might see higher numbers of ewes aborting just for. Um, just that later infection. So from a, a number of reports, but also from um, the research we have done, on average, when Campylobacter is having an effect on farm, it's usually accounting for approximately 9% losses in your mob. And when I say 9%, you know, often you don't see these losses, they're subclinical losses, and it's difficult to um, certainly identify whether Campylobacter may have had an effect if you're not um, aware of it. Um, and also the other thing is it's, again, it's all about the um, challenge and the, um, being exposed to the bacteria. So you may only see losses sometimes in one mob, not in all mobs. Now, I'm not sure how many of you may have seen or come across an abortion storm, but they, that's what you would see. Um, it's obviously very, evident, but you can, there have been reports from 10 to 50% loss of lambs. So if you're seeing 30 to 50% losses of lambs, um, yeah, there's something certainly definitely going on and it's certainly worth investigating. What I probably didn't mention earlier, if you are seeing abortions, one recommendation I certainly do have, if you're seeing abortions, you don't know what's going on, I really do recommend that you get um, a vet out to investigate further because it's a lot easier to try to identify or diagnose what is going on at the time the event is occurring. It is certainly a lot more difficult um, when you're at landmarking and you're really disappointed with some results and you, it's a lot more difficult to work out what may have happened at that time because it's past the event. Uh, abortion storms are sometimes cyclic, so sometimes occur you know, five, every five to seven years. Reason being, if it's been an abortion storm, there would have been a lot of use exposed 
and a lot of natural challenge at that time. So there's not going to be a lot of challenge afterwards because there's been a good, once they've had good exposure, the ewes are then immune to that bacteria and won't abort you, um, lambs after that occasion. Um, and for that reason, maidens are the most often affected. But again, um, if Campylobacter is endemic on farm, which means it's present on farm, um, then the adult ewes have had good natural exposure over time to then be able to mount a good immune response when challenged with the bacteria. However, with maidens, and a lot of people have ewe lambs, um, well, adjoining ewe lambs these days, they are your most susceptible because they, they're still young and they just haven't had probably enough time to be exposed to um, the nat natural organism or natural challenge. So a lot of the time when I do speak with farmers who think, oh, wondering whether campy may be a problem on farm, I ask them just to have a think about, you know, A, do they scan, which is a really good start. And what is your difference between your scanning to marking percentages? Now, there's always going to be some losses, absolutely. But certainly, I guess we use a threshold or a figure of, you know, if it's greater than 15%, have a think about what else might be going on. And again, yep, yeah, there certainly can be some extreme environmental occasions where you can account or dogs um, getting into a mob but yeah if historically if there's a, a large difference then um, it's worth considering what might be going on because potentially it could be something you could address down the track. Um, the other one is also what is your difference in marking percentage between matures and maiden use. Now again there's always going to be um, maidens are most usually going to be lower percentage than matures but what is that difference and is that gap too large for that you consider is greater than what it should be and should it be worth a further investigation. So I spoke about it being oral transmission and not a venereal disease. Um, so it's a spread primarily by aborted material. So if, you've, if it's within the flock and a ewe has aborted due to a Campylobacter infection, then you can imagine that aborted material, that fetus contains a very high challenge load of the bacterial organism. Often ewes will get inquisitive and come and see what has happened. And it's orally ingest, you know, um, around that area. They'll be um, not only on the fetus, they might just um, ingest some of the bacterial organism from that, but also um, in the surrounding area, if, they, if it's close to a feed source or something like that, it's just that opportunity um, to become infected. Feed and water, and that's primarily depending on where the abortion has occurred, and also infected feces. So I, I know I'll probably get asked this question, so I might answer it now. Uh, question might be whether rams can also um, be responsible for infections. Um, they can certainly um, have Campylobacter, but it's off. They are very, very they are very unlikely source of um, abortions for the ewes, just because they would only be ever shedding very low levels of Campylobacter and fecal matter. So it's very unlikely that there would be um, a high enough challenge load for a ewe to really um, ever be of an effect at all. But certainly ewes can um, shed in their fecal matter as well. The bacteria can also be spread by foxes. So when we include foxes, um, you probably would realize that, you know, a late term abortion or a stillborn birth or just a, um, an ill thrift lamb that has died, the foxes will come um, and take it um, and could even take it into a different paddock and then it could be a source um, into another paddock and a different, different mob as well. So, um, and also neighbouring. I have, um, you do often, if you've got neighbours that have a lot of sheep and they might be having a, um, some problems, depending on what it is. If a fox drags one of those aborted fetuses through the fence, then there's every opportunity that the flock or the mob next door um, could become infected as well. And again, you just imagine with that aborted fetus, the high challenge load of bacteria on that. Uh, we've got a similar with um, birds and well, particularly crows and particularly around water sources and kangaroos and goats, they can also be a source of infection. So um, no, there's been, I don't think there's been very, I don't think there's been any work done on that. Uh, we have collected some bloods from kangaroos and goats. We do know that they do carry jejuni. But, um, uh, and again, when you've got drought conditions, you can imagine they're all hanging around watering points. So they could be contributing to, uh, as a source of infection as well. The other big one is buying and carry a sheep. So firstly, if, you're, if you've got a naive flock at home and nothing's been happening, 
um, but you have come out of the drought and you see an opportunity to buy 300 ewes in, you potentially could be bringing oh, one or two of the strains onto your farm and then you've got naive sheep. So potentially you could be bringing that onto farm and infecting your sheep. Uh, likewise with you might have it, it might be endemic on your farm and the sheep you bring in might also be naive. So they are quite vulnerable as well. So there's quite a few little things to consider. The management risks, we spoke about it earlier in regards to um, ewe lambs and maiden ewes. They are your most susceptible because they would have had the least opportunity to have been exposed if it is endemic on farm. So they're your high, they're your most susceptible ewes. What we found, and I'm, I'm talking from my experiences in New South Wales during the drought times, and no doubt you guys experience um, a number of droughts yourselves. Um, so you're probably very, very familiar with it. And many of you might do this as well, but confinement feeding, even out Western New South Wales during the drought, a lot of people were um, obviously feeding the sheep, but in confinement. So when you think about that, these sheep are in a higher stocking rate. And given that they're certainly not grazing paddocks as they usually do, there is this more opportunity if these ewes are under a bit of stress and Campylobacter may be within the flock, and there are a couple of abortions, there is this a greater opportunity in a high stocking rate sit situation for other ewes to become infected and a larger number of those ewes. Um, so introducing sheep, we've spoken about that, but protect, particularly pregnant ewes, um, they're under stress A through travel. Um, so if they are infected, it just might be um, their immune systems on the way is declining, leading into lambing because they're putting all their resources typically into their fetus. So if they're under a bit of extra stress from long transport time, you might find again, there might be one or two abortions, which then might um, create a little bit of havoc within the flock there as well. I've got included stud use there. I'm not sure how many producers are on tonight that have stud use and HSR high stocking rate. Often, um, if you do have stud use on a farm, they probably are in a high stocking rate in a paddock closer to home a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, they're probably just another, um, again, being in the high stocking rate scenario, they might be at greater risk as well. So diagnoses. There's a certainly, um, I, like I said earlier, I do encourage if you are getting abortions to um, engage um, the services of a veterinarian because um, they will be able to help you diagnose what is going on. You know, even though Campylobacter is a, um, a common a common organism for causing abortions or late-term abortions, there are, it could be something else as well. So it often when, you know, most people do do something with their ewes pre-lambing um, and you may often see that blood breached, um, blood stained breach in the yards and you might observe a, a, you know, a fetus or an abortion occurring. Um, most ewes don't show any signs of ill health aborting ewes. They, they, pretend, they often just abort and they remain in good health, but there is, of course, that opportunity that they, they might become um, get a secondary infection. But with the, um, the aborted fetus um, or a, a stillborn lamb, you can see that picture up in the left-hand corner of the liver. There's a couple of foci points here, and it does not happen on every single um, fetus, but this foci point on the liver is often a good indicator that Campylobacter may have been uh, one of the, may be, may be the cause but don't rely on that because it doesn't happen on all occasions. Um, often a vet, when they do come up, they'll also take um, a swab of the gut contents of the, um, of the fetus as well. And they'll just culture the, the stomach contents um, to see it, you know, what organisms may be present. Now, this is what I'll get into a little bit, short, into a bit later on, but there is a blood test available. And what happens here, it can detect and provide some different um, teeter levels or recent exposure to Campylobacter. So I will show some, um, uh, some slides shortly, but there is a blood test and it's usually what we do when we're taking blood. It's not certainly taking blood at the time of an, of an abortion. It's looking, this is one occasion where I, um, we do after the event, may take some bloods just to see um, if the Campylobacter infection has been circulating recently within the U. So it might just give you some indication of whether Campylobacter was causing um, the, the abortions. One big thing I always like to include this slide is the fact that please always remember that um, 
with anything, if there's been if there's been any event, it's always good to you know ideally wear gloves if you've got them. But be always be very careful if you are handling um, fetuses or aborted material. Always wash your hands, um, just because it is a, a zoonotic disease and it can cause some um, gastroenteritis. So just yeah, be very be very mindful of that. Okay, so blood testing results. So I've sort of gone away a little bit. Um, the uh, our vaccine was released back in late 2013, and after that time, we had the opportunity to do, I guess, a prevalence survey where we were able to take some blood samples from some ewes. Um, during this time, we would target or speak with producers that have had what they considered poor landmarking results, and they also scan. So we know we can rule out a few other factors, you know, um, RAM and nutrition and condition score of use at that time. So we would always ask if they had scanned and we'd focus on taking some bloods from some dry maiden use if, if they considered that their landmarking results weren't up to scratch or what they had hoped for. So the reason being is, you know, we're not suggesting that every dry ewe there, um, Campylobacter, it was um, they're dry because of Campylobacter, but if Campylobacter is having an effect in this mob or on farm, then we should be able to get a pretty a good idea by taking some bloods from the dry use and just seeing what is going on. As you can see, uh, we've taken um, bloods and that's this is a heat map. So it just shows you and you can sort of see how many samples have been taken from each state there uh, and the positions from where they've come from. So it gives you a little bit of an indication of um, how prevalent Campylobacter is. And of course, you've just got to remember, you know, the main sheep producing air regions within these states as well. Of course, being a bacterial organism and um, I guess disease expression, et cetera, you would assume that um, it would be predominantly occurring in, I guess, uh, warm, moist areas or cool, moist areas, just because you would think the organism would survive better under those conditions. But you can see that uh, when I first started back in 2015, uh, because I do do work up in Queensland as well, I did a training trip myself uh, with my manager and uh, we did actually just go up to um, within Queensland and we uh, went up to Longreach and Barcolden areas as well. And we just on this occasion just randomly took some bloods just to, I guess, um, just to determine whether Campylobacter were, was a problem in this region. Um, really, we were very, very surprised that we had a, I think we took, may have targeted about 10 farms, but we had a 100% success rate. Uh, with Campylobacter in Queensland in these dry conditions, dry hot conditions. So that was quite an eye opener for us uh, up there. So, and as you can see, it's certainly well, um, it's quite prevalent across the, in the main sheep producing flocks across Australia. Now I spoke earlier about um, there are two strains and I haven't really spoken about the two strains. So fetus fetus is probably your most um, familiar or common or main organism causing abortion. So it's probably the, your, yeah, the, uh, the one that we focus on um, a lot more, but we know jejuni also causes abortion as, as well. But we do know that um, potentially the um, fetus fetus is probably more pathogenic than jejuni, but certainly jejuni can cause abortions. From all the testing that we did, um, over 90% or almost 90% of farms tested positive to Campylobacter and uh, to one, or both strain or one, at least one strain. And what we found two out of three farms um, had fetus fetus on farm. So that's what we consider the most pathogenic strain. So with the blood results, I'll show you an example in a tick, but what, it, what I'm gonna be looking at is the exposure. So is it, is it positive or negative or has there been recent exposure or would we consider there hasn't been or it's not on farm? And then because we did target you know, within a three month window of lamb marking. So that's where taking samples from ewes close to when an event may have occurred, the level of antibodies should be higher if there was recent exposure and potentially having an effect on these ewes. I also, because I collect 10 samples, I just look also at the number of ewes that were exposed, certainly not expecting 10 out of 10, but it just you are able to eyeball what what was happening and whether you considered that Campylobacter was having an effect on these um, on this mob, 
And then I also look at the strains, because as I said, I'll consider uh, fetus fetus a lot more pathogenic, but certainly look at the, um, the TEDA levels for jejuni as well. So I'd love for these results just to be positive and negative, and that would be an easy answer to discuss further with farmers. But when you have a look at some of these results, um, it's, yeah, you just got to interpret them as they come because you get individual results for each of the ewes. So looking at this one, you can see fetus up here and jejuni, these were three-year-old ewes. And what I see here is that one, two, three, four, five. So if you're five out of 10 animals, had a, um, a teeter greater than one is one is to 80 or greater. So when I see that, I consider there has certainly has been some recent exposure to fetus fetus. Similarly with jejuni, jejuni, I should have said earlier, it is actually a common gut inhabitant. So jejuni, uh, if we see jejuni present, it's not unsurprising because it is a common bacteria. What I do look at is certainly um, the teeter values and um, with jejuni, our threshold is probably more so one is to 160 rather than one is to 80. So look at here, we do have a couple of one is to 80s. Um, there has been some recent exposure, but I'm probably certainly more interested in the fetus fetus side. And on this occasion with these results, I would have confidence to say to the farmer that I think Campylobacter fetus fetus would have had played some role in poor land marking results. Michelle, this one, can you just exp yes. explain, you've got tea today. Can you just explain what that is, please? What that means? Yes, yes absolutely. I'll, I'll do my best, sorry. I won't probably won't do it too well, but it's a dilution factor. So it they keep diluting the SAMP. So they um, we collect um, the bloods, they'll take the sera from the bloods, and then it'll be a dilution factor for each individual animal. So that um, until they can't um, recognize any of that bacteria within that sample. So the higher the teeter, the higher the exp recent exposure. So they do, we do have some results, and I've got one coming up, well, this one here, where you've got um, less than one is to 10. There was um, nothing was found in that sample. They couldn't find any um, evidence of fetus within that sample. And sometimes I might just have a red one is to 10 and just a little bit of background noise. They may have just been able to find something. So the higher the teeter, the um, more confidence you've got recent exposure to, to that strain. Is that all right, Jodie? Fantastic, thanks. So this result here, and I do have a couple, um, I'll, I'll go through them a little bit quicker, but when I quickly eyeball um, these results here, Firstly, I guess, you know, my eye has just been taken to the strong results for the jejuni section. Um, so looking at those results and for what I said previously, I do look at the one is to 160 and above, and there's four animals above that. There's certainly um, another five animals that have one is to 80. So I see it has had some recent stress, recent circulation. I look on the other side, um, we know there's, looking at that, there's some fetus on farm. But on this occasion, yeah, I do think there's been some absolutely some recent exposure to jejuni and um, I'd just be having further conversations with the farmer with what he's seen but the big thing here is we what this tells me also is that fetus is on farm so that's something we we know that is the most pathogenic and if fetus is on farm there is going to be on some occasion some losses due to campylobacter now, this is an interesting one, and I've kept it in because I found it quite interesting. But this was um, during the drought times, and these animals were in a confinement feeding in a feedlot situation. There had been um, reports of losses, um, and we took some bloods from these ewes. And um, so the, the losses occurred, um, I think, in the prior season. But what this shows us here is um, mixed-aged ewes. And it's endemic on farm. And that just probably reflects to me that previously in there, um, uh, these girls have certainly been previously exposed, obviously, to both fetus and jejuni, and probably reflective of the abortion events that occurred um, at the previous lambing. So the teeters, they're not high, but they're still, they're still there. But the big thing that it does show me is what we were referring to earlier in regards to your most susceptible stock being maidens, these girls are uh, well and truly very, very susceptible. Now these are confinement feeding. Um, they're, they're, not, they're not in the same pens, but they're alongside each other. 
So if there was a you here that was not in good health, like I said earlier, once once they've had good exposure, they are immune. But again, you've got to remember that um, similar with us, and I guess we all use COVID as a good example these days. If, if we're not in good health, then our immune system won't respond appropriately to in an, an infection. So I guess during drought times, they were being fed. They may not have been um, in as good a condition as they would be grazing in normal times. So there's every potential one of these ewes may abort. It wasn't I'm not saying it was the case on this occasion. And then if, a, if these ewes here, these maiden ewes got um, any opportunity um, to be challenged with a high load of bacteria, then it would quite, go quite rampant through these ewes because they're in that high stocking rate scenario. So I'd, I just like that example. I just like to show farmers, um, that's it's a, just a really good example. Now, the other question we've been getting often or recently is also what about my mature ewes? So, I always, have, I always ask a lot of questions with farmers to see what's happening on farm and what might be going on. And again, I alluded to before, if it's endemic on farm, our focus often is you know, vaccinating or looking after our maiden or our ewe lambs or maiden ewes and potentially second lambers because once animals have had or ewes have had good exposure, natural exposure, they are then immune from the, um, the infection. However, over time, or um, you know, does that immunity wane at all? Um, because you are sort of relying on some natural challenge to keep it ticking along. And this, I mean, this is just an example, but we, and I'm not sure what has happened on this farm, but um, we did take some bloods and you can see that, you know, fetus is on farm, but these ewes I would suspect are quite um, susceptible now. Um, and they would certainly, you know, depending on the production system, there is that discussion on whether it'd be worth vaccinating these girls here as well, because to me, um, it's present, but not very high. Did you know, I, I would suspect I, bloods may have been collected uh, within that three month lamb marking window. Um, they are one is to 80. So there has been some recent circulation, but my biggest concern is what what should be the approach for future with these ewes. Now, the question is, I have spoken a fair bit about blood testing, um, but, you know, do you need to blood test? Um, my, my, whenever I speak, I, I speak with farmers and ask them a lot about their operations, what's going on. Um, a lot of farmers these days um, may decide I, they would like to know what is happening on farm. Um, we don't consider it as necessary. It's more a case of um, trying to mitigate the risk on farm and potentially focusing on your most susceptible sheep to start with. Um, but there's, it's not necessary, but um, you know, there's, if you wanted to, farmers can take some bloods just, and it'd be a case of really identifying whether fetus is on farm in regards to consideration for um, vaccinating. Um, the, and the other reason is like, I did speak about it earlier in regards to, it's all about the challenge, the oral ingestion of the bacteria and the, the load, the, um, the amount that's been in, ingested to whether there will be um, an abortion event. Um, so I, it's, it's all about the challenge. So it's the challenge may differ from year to year. So it's hard to um, predict what's gonna happen. Every, it's very hard, you can't predict what's gonna happen every year. So I liken it these days to, and particularly given the um, what sheep are worth and lambs are worth um, look similar to a clostridial vaccination because you're just trying to mitigate the risk and um, particularly if it is endemic on farm there's likely to be some losses at some time. The vaccine I'm not sure how many of you may be, be familiar with Campivax um, it was released in late 2013 and it is it does contain the vaccine does contain the, um, the strains both for jejuni and fetus fetus and it's an aid in control of the re reproductive losses due to both those strains. Um, it is a two mil dose subcut. And in, on the first occasion, you do have to give two doses. And I did speak about earlier in regards to focusing on ewe lambs and maiden ewes and potentially second lambers. When I do say second lambers, often it's a case, you just have to give them the annual booster to just to boost that protection for the following season. When to vaccinate? Good question. As you know, with clostridials, you typically vaccinate prior to an event occurring, similar to Campy, um, Campyvax. You want to, we know that the abortions typically occur in the third trimester. Uh, so the most appropriate time to vaccinate would be prior to joining. 
and you, you vaccinate with the first dose and then three to eight weeks later, give the second dose. Many farmers may also go vaccination rams in, rams out, and there's usually a five to six week um, window there for joining. Um, so it's just working out the most appropriate time to fit in with your management strategies. But you can always speak one, with one of us uh, further if you want to discuss a program. Should you vaccinate? Um, certainly, yeah, as I said earlier, certainly um, if you're seeing abortions, ask a vet to investigate so you can actually work out what might be going on, farm, what's happening on farm. If you are seeing a lot of a, some fetuses, but also with the weak non-viable lambs, remember, you get a few abortions that are occurring, but if you get some use um, infected later, then you'll get some weak non-viable lambs. Also, if there is um, that 15% gap between marking and scanning, and also a greater than 15% gap between maiden and mature ewes. I think what was highlighted during the drought conditions is certainly confinement feeding. So if you are confinement feeding, I, I could certainly um, recommend vaccination would be um, a, a very good op option to mitigate the risk at that time. And ewe lambs and maiden ewes and stud ewes would be um, certainly the higher risk animals. A commercial, yeah, I, I probably won't go too much into this. Um, I guess uh, we've spoken about this already a fair bit, well, a lot, but certainly uh, if you are buying in use, um, certainly they, they are either going to be at risk or could be risk, risk uh, be a risk to your mob as well. And high value animals with particularly your stud use. So it's just working out um, what's happening on farm and whether you should focus on um, potentially vaccinating your most susceptible to mitigate the risk of losses. Like with any vaccine, it's not a silver bullet. Um, I did have a, um, a picture up earlier in regards to a jigsaw puzzle. There's so many factors that contribute to a really good landmarking result. And you try to get as many of these um, pieces to the puzzle um, fixed as, as you can and addressed. But like with anything, it's um, a, a vaccination isn't a silver bullet, but, so it'll, but it will protect against losses, certainly in an abortion storm and the sporadic losses or the subclinical losses. I do also speak with a lot of farmers um, in regards to, I think a lot of you these days certainly keep very, very good records. So it's really worth going back, particularly um, if you were to vaccinate for one year, I recommend um, potentially even vaccinating for a couple of years just to be more reflective of historical data. And also the fact that you are, um, the challenge will differ every year. So it's just keeping some very good records, particularly with your scanning rates, marking rates, and um, over time, just to see what is, what is happening. And particularly the, different, um, the difference between both uh, maiden and adult use. And that's it. Sorry, I did fly through the last couple of slides because I thought I was running out of time, Jody. But um, yeah, hopefully I have provided um, some information to everybody and there might be some questions. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, Michelle. We've got a few questions come in. Um, the first one we've got through and it's come from one of our come in is about what's the cost, Michelle, to vaccinate per dose? Oh, oh gee, I didn't do my research. Um, <laughs> it, I, I think it's about, a, Sam might be on the line, about $1.90 a shot. So it might be, um, uh, yeah, so it might be about $1.90 to $2 a, a shot, but I might get Sam if he's on the line to text me and I might be able to update you on that one. Yeah, no, he's not actually so there, Michelle. I, I get that question every single time and sorry, what was that? <laughs> no, Joe? Sam's not there, but yeah, we might. Have to oh, be. sorry about that. But that's right. What yes. we'll do is we'll get, we'll take that one on notice and we'll get back to you guys yeah. and um, let so you know often, what that So often what we yeah, it'll be around that that mark. Often we do say, um, ask your stores because it'll differ within stores as well. That's the only thing. Yep. So approximately that sort of somewhere between $1.50 and $2-ish yes. per dose. Uh, probably between $1.80 to $2, yeah. Right, yep. No worries. So, yep, talk to your um, local retailer and they'll be able to give you a yep. hand with that price. So, But that's a good guide for producers that are on the line. Yep. But we will, um, I will post that to Sam and get back to you. Um, yeah, thank you. The other question I have that's come in is how long does the bacteria last on the ground or in pastures where you have oh, good abortions? Yeah, good question. Um, so I guess a lot of things, just always think of your microclimate, um, but certainly if it's in the soil, it will only last for um, maybe up to seven days. 
um, if it's out, expo out in the open, probably three days in the soil, three to seven days. So no, it doesn't last for that long, but you do have carrier use within a flock. So uh, potentially they are shedding it in the fecal matter. Um, there's not gonna be, a if it's been shed in fecal matter, it's not gonna be high challenge loads, but it just keeps cycling through the mob. So um, certainly uh, what a, uh, within a, a ewe that has aborted, she'll still continue shedding high numbers of bacteria for approximately six weeks after the abortion event, just in her uterine discharge. So she's still contributing to um, the environment with, with that as well. So still adding to it, which is a source of infection for other ewes that still uh, that is still prior to lambing and how yeah. they can get infected. Okay, great. Question from one of the producers online. If I've vaxxed for the past two years, can I assume they're okay for the next few years or do I need to continue vaccinating? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, our our main, main recommendation is that if it, if it is endemic on farm, then by that time, those ewes that have, um, they're probably two or three years old at that stage, they should have had enough opportunity to have been, had some natural exposure over that time. So that you would uh, hope, and from our, from our work, I guess, and our confidence that um, if it is endemic on farm, then it's typically, um, having more an effect on the maiden young ewes or second lammers. So our recommendation, if it's endemic, we focus on vaccinating the maiden ewes and second lammers, and then often people don't vaccinate their adult ewes. It's a lot of a conversation, it depends on what you're doing, whether you're buying sheep in, um, buying ewes in, things like that, um, or what has happened in the past, whether, you know, is it endemic on farm, are they at risk? Um, but if it is endemic, then, typically farmers would just vaccinate their maidens and second lammers. Great, thank you. Um, question here is, um, can I vaccinate late if I've missed the window that you talked about? <laughs> Good question. I always walk, work backwards um, because um, the abortion, like, um, abortion start occurring in the third trimester. So as long as I always, again, work backwards. And again, um, as long as the booster is given approximately eight weeks prior to lambing commencing, and then a minimum of three weeks prior to that. So it's about 11 weeks prior to lambing commencing. So that it's not ideal because you've got to bring them in on another two occasions. Um, but working backward, you just want to make sure they're primed up. Like with any vaccine, you look at um, the, they're not going to be fully protected until that booster is given. And it's not on that occasion, on that day, it's usually another week after that when, or week to 10 days, that they're at their highest protection. So you just wanna make sure that these ewes are protected before the event can start occurring. Great, thank you. Um, that brings us to the end of the question. So thank you to everyone who's joined us for today's webinar. Michelle, thank you so much for sharing your insight and expertise with us all. If you've got additional questions that you think about after tonight's webinar, Contact us directly using the contact information on your webinar registration and I'll follow those up with Michelle. Thank you for your time everyone and have a lovely evening. Bye.